Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the next session on basics of video technology. So this is where we stopped last time. Right? We saw that you can actually transmit a text file, for instance, um, using sound and amplitude modulation. And we saw it in this experiment where we encoded a file, first a binary file, then a text file, then um, used uh, the AM encoder to produce sound from it, then transmit the sound from my little iPod Touch to my laptop, then we had a noisy version, and then we used the AM decoded, uh, EMD, the AM decoder program to decode it back into a file, um, a binary file, which can also be a text file. And this is what we saw then last, um, that we used um, a text file for transmission and we saw indeed oops, here, that we got our text file back. Right? So the decoded file, am decoded.bin, um, is identical, was identical to test.txt. So in principle you could use this uh, these programs then to um, say um, make a program that sends um, SMS via sound and if you, if you use the sound card at high enough sampling rate, say 48 kilohertz, then you could actually transmit this um, information at say 20 kilohertz where nobody can hear it and then you have a wireless SMS transmitter and receiver using inaudible sound. And you wouldn't even need a license because sound is, um, can be used without a license. So that's kind of maybe a nice application. So, let's continue then with the theory. So, when we want to analyze uh, what's going on with the amplitude modulation, uh, we can use the so-called pointer diagram. Basically, we can write the signal as a complex pointer, uh, which we will do now. So, starting with the spectrum of our payload signal, so the payload is the um, signal that we want to transmit. Um, then we can see the spectrum of our amplitude modulated signal, which you can see here below. So here you can see on the spectrum appears on the upper side band above the carrier and at the lower side band below the carrier. So it appears twice and uh, this arrow in the middle is the carrier which doesn't carries all the information, it just has the decoding. Right. So that means the bandwidth of our AM signal is twice as large as the bandwidth of our baseband signal, um, the signal to be modulated onto the carrier, because we have two mirror identical sidebands. For instance, when we look at the AM band broadcast, AM band from 550 kilohertz to about 1600 kilohertz, um, which is not used in Germany anymore. Um, this has a bandwidth of 8 kilohertz from one channel to the next. Right? And that means our useful signal is an audio signal that has 4 kilohertz bandwidth. So that's kind of narrow. Right? So actually, they used um, non-adjacent channels for nearby stations so they could actually make um, the bandwidth twice as large but actually most receivers only use this 4 kilohertz for uh, demodulation so that's why it didn't sound much better than telephone quality right. so that's kind of a disadvantage of amplitude modulation it's not very efficient with the bandwidth so that means the bandwidth of the payload signal is limited by the bandwidth of the transmission channel, which means it only can be half of the transmission channel spacing. So that's an important limitation. And in Europe we have a channel spacing of 4 kilohertz, and to increase the audio base bandwidth, as I just mentioned, the adjacent transmitter should be far away to allow wider transmission default despite the narrow channel spacing but most receivers only use 
uh, 4.5 kilohertz bandwidth because they have a bandpass filter with a bandwidth of only 9 kilohertz, just for simplicity. Yeah. So this is only a little bit wider than telephone speech at 3.5 kilohertz. Although at AM, often the lower frequencies are also transmitted, unlike telephone, which starts at about 200 or 300 hertz. Yeah, and the reason is um, for this low bandwidth, this narrow um, band spacing, this uh, channel spacing, is that medium wave is at re relatively low frequencies between 515 and 1600 kilohertz. And hence the band altogether is very relatively narrow. It's just a little bit more than one megahertz, the total band. So all the different stations have to share the same band, and that means that our channel spacing has to be narrow. Yeah. So in Germany, public AM stations are shut down because of dwindling audiences and because of the poor resulting audio quality. Yeah, and when we look at TV, television, analog video, then we see that amplitude modulation is for the transmission of the luminance information. So the black and white image, basically. Right? So for TV, the base band uses approximately 5 megahertz of luminance bandwidth. So this is what comes out of the analog camera. It's a signal which has about 5 megahertz bandwidth. So that's uh, quite considerable. Um, and it's, for instance, much larger than the entire medium wave band. Right? Remember, me medium wave was 1 megahertz. Here, just one signal out of the camera already has 5 megahertz. And if you, were to, if you want to transmit it via AM, it would double the bandwidth. Right? So on an um, AM channel, it would cover 10 megahertz. So that's quite a lot. Right? So it shows it's not possible on the medium wave band. So we need a wider band, and that means we need higher frequencies. And that's why for TV, first two-way VHF bands were used. The first band is between 45 and 68 megahertz. And this was um, pretty much the first band used for TV. And it's not used um, anymore. Um, and it shows you this is a bandwidth of more than 20 megahertz. Right? So I'm um, using just AM would be able to fit for, um, roughly two channels, yeah, two TV channels. So it's actually also not very wide. So then the next band was 175 to 225 megahertz. So this is above uh, the FM radio band. So this has more bandwidth. So this is more like See 30, 50 megahertz bandwidth. So here we could fit uh, 10 channels, but we just use AM. And then we have the much wider UHF band. So this came later. So, um, so this came in the in the 60s, in the 1960 uh, 60 years, um, when the technology was available for UHF and receivers, which were sufficiently cheap for on consumer electronics. So this has much wider bandwidth. So this has three, 330 megahertz bandwidth for the entire band. And what's actually used is 7 megahertz for each channel. And that means we get 47 channels. So this was then now more practical. And this is why this UHF band is basically mostly used today. Basically all the stations that are transmitting analog and now mostly digital are transmitting on this band. Right. So that also means um, we have smaller antennas because the wavelength is much shorter. Yeah. So this 7 megahertz now is less than the 10 megahertz that we just considered. 
So remember, we have this 5.5 .5 megahertz video bandwidth. Using AM would mean 10 megahertz, but here we just have 7 megahertz spacing. So this shows that there must be some additional trick here. And this is the so called residual sideband modulation. Yeah, so this is what I just said. UHF means ultra high frequency. But still, the 10 megahertz from our video signal would be too much. Right? So the solution then is to, you, to use a filter and to suppress one of the two AM sidebands. So basically, we start with AM modulation. So we take the camera, modulate it on the carrier, we get 10 megahertz bandwidth, but then we take a filter and suppress one of the two sidebands. For instance, the law. So that only a small rest of this sideband remains. So in principle, the entire information of our video is still present in the other sideband, right? the upper sideband. It's unsuppressed. But the lower sideband, which had a copy of the information, is now suppressed. Okay. So in principle, we could reduce the bandwidth without much damage. So this is the so-called residual sideband modulation. So here you can see what happens in this diagram. You can see here horizontal is the frequency on the horizontal axis, vertical axis the amplitude. Then this red line is the filter, um, the filter transfer function uh, that we use for the residual sideband. And that suppresses the lower um, sideband to a residual sideband so that we get less from it. Basically, we don't need it because it has the same information. And um, you could ask, why not suppress it completely? Well, the answer is because it's easier to demodulate in a TV set if you just leave a little bit of it. And most of all, if you leave the carrier. So the carrier is also somewhat reduced, but it's still there. Yeah. So this could be also used for AM broadcasting to reduce the bandwidth. But it's not really done, um, basically, to keep the old standard. And um, the plan originally was to, um, to replace AM right away by a digital transmission, um, like Digital Radio Mondial. Um, but that didn't quite succeed so far. So instead, basically, AM broadcast is, is dying out, which is kind of unfortunate because it um, has a wide range coverage. Okay. Yeah, so residual sideband modulation is an easy way to reduce the bandwidth of our signal on our channel and still keep the receiver simple. But there are also other more efficient possibilities. So to analyze what's going on, this is residual sideband, for instance, um, we use this complex pointer diagram and basically use Euler's formula uh, for the connection between the sine wave of the transmitter and this complex pointer. So the sine wave of the transmitter is basically a complex pointer which rotates as the frequency of the transmitter, but we only take the imaginary part of it. So the imaginary part of this complex pointer is the sinusoid of our transmitter. Make sense? So just writing, rewriting the sign as imaginary part of this complex pointer. And remember, the complex pointer is the cosine omega t times lowercase t plus j sine of omega t times lowercase t. So the imaginary part is the sine function. So here is an illustration in a complex plane. So you can see um, the real axis and the imaginary axis. And the real axis consists of the cosine of some angle phi. Remember phi is this omega t times lowercase t. And the imaginary axis is the sine. So then just taking the imaginary 
basically taking the projection on the imaginary axis gives you the sine function, which the usual stuff. And also this allows you to compute the magnitude. The magnitude corresponds to um, the amplitude of our signal and this is just the apps function. And we saw the X function is real part squared plus imaginary part squared and the sum out of it. Right. So we take, we can easily take the magnitude and we saw that this allows us a simple way to mathematically compute the amplitude of our signal. So in this way we can actually compute the amplitude demodulation by just taking the magnitude of our carrier point. Yeah, makes sense? So the magnitude here is convenient to mathematically obtain the amplitude. Yeah, so this formulation can be used to describe AM demodulation by just using the apps value, which we have already used for the demodulation software in Python last time. Right? We have the cosine and the sine carrier and then took the squares and the sum and the square root. So when you have software demodulation, then this is what's uh, usually done. So since our signal is to modulate S of t, um, is S of t, and this is soon to be real valued, amplitude modulation is just 1 plus S times sine, and this is the imaginary part of our pointer multiplied by 1 plus S. And then magnitude is simply 1 plus s. So this shows you that we can easily do the demodulation by just computing the apps function. So this is doing our demodulation. Yeah. So next we can take a look at our signal itself. So we can just we can um, describe our signal S also has a sum of sinusoids, uh, if we apply the Fourier transform, for instance. Um, and you can just look at a single sinusoid out of this mix. Right? So if you have music or speech, basically you have a sum of many sinusoids, and we just pick one of them. And this is this omega sine of omega s times lowercase t, omega s for signal frequency. And then again, we can use Euler's formula to um, write, rewrite the um, sine function as the imaginary part of this point. And here, e to the j omega minus e to the minus j omega divided by 2j gives us the imaginary part. Make sense? So that means the AM signal is then the imaginary part of this complex modulation. So we have this S for T, this 1 divided by 2J, um, and then the, in the parenthesis the two complex pointers. 1 plus comes from the AM modulation. So here the first part is our A modulation of the signal. We have this part here is the AM modulation, and then this comes from the transmitter. Right? This is the complex transmitter modulation. And since the transmitter was this imaginary part here, we have this imaginary part here. Right? Make sense? So basically I just replace this S in this formula here. We have 1 plus S times e to the j omega or here in this form, an imaginary part of 1 plus s times e to the j omega t times lowercase t, and replaced this s by this form. So here you can then find 1 plus. Yeah. I just have one question. We do the assumption that for the signal, the side of side that we pick is not phase shifted. Um, compared to our carrier wave, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a 
It's just a sine of salt. Right. You know, it doesn't really matter. You could also take a cosine. Okay. You know. So this basically shows uh, what's going on by picking one of the sine salts as an illustration. And the important part is then here the next line. Um, because now we can actually factor out the exponential factors here. So we have this term e to the j omega s times t times e to the j omega t times t. And the other terms. So then what results is we have this term, this unchanged term, coming from the 1. Well, we have 1 times e to the j omega t times t. So the carrier is left unchanged. And then we have those products of those two terms. So here, this first times um, this part gives the sum of the two, e to the j omega t plus omega s, because this is positive. And here you have e to the minus j omega s. So here you get e to the minus j omega t minus omega s. Make sense. Let's see. What is omega s? Yes. Hmm. Should it be the other way around? Omega s minus omega t. Hmm. In any case, it doesn't really matter. What's important here is that this is the lower sideband, the difference, and this is the upper sideband, the sum. So again, we, can, we see we get the sum and the difference in the frequencies, meaning upper sideband, the sum, lower sideband, the difference between the two. Make sense? So this shot now again shows why we get two sidebands. The multiplication of the exponential terms leads to a summation of the frequencies. So here you have the carrier, and here you have minus omega s, and here you have plus omega s. Make sense so far? So some and different frequencies again. The two sidebands show up. And now what, you, what we have here is that the sidebands show up, the sidebands and the carrier show up as complex pointers. Remember here, we still have this imaginary part in front of it, but neglecting this imaginary part for, uh, at first, we see that we have three complex pointers now. Right? This first pointer is fast rotating because this rotates with the frequency of our transmitter. So maybe uh, many million times per second. Right? Then the other two pointers rotate with almost the same speed but slightly different. So the first pointer here, the upper sideband, rotates slightly faster than uh, the carrier because we have the sum frequency, transmission, transmission frequency plus signal frequency. So this is the upper side end. So this rotates a little faster. Then this last complex exponential rotates a little slower because this is the lower side end. So it rotates with the frequency of carrier frequency minus signal frequency. So we have three carriers with different speeds. So this is not easy to visualize because now we are in 2D. So basically, we have, yeah, this is what I just said omega t times lowercase t is the rotating pointer with the angular frequency of the carrier. And here we have the pointers of the sideband. The first turns faster, the second rotates slower than the carrier. Yeah, so we have fast pointing 
um, fast rotating pointers and the imaginary projection on the imaginary axis is the sine function. Yeah, then the question is how do these sideband pointers uh, behave relative to the carrier point? For that basically we imagine that we rotate together with the pointer. Right? So the pointers, pointers uh, the carrier pointer stands still, like in this diagram. So we basically sit on the carrier pointer and observe the sideband point, uh, pointers. Right? Like we rotate a few million times per second and just observe how the sideband pointers look relative to it. And this can be seen here. So the carrier pointer here is the middle. And then we have the addition of the two sideband pointers. So here you can see the lower sideband pointer and the upper sideband uh, side pointer. So if the carrier pointer rotates very quickly counterclockwise in the mathematical positive sense, then this lower point, uh, pointer was rotating a little bit slower and that means it rotates in the opposite direction. And the upper side then pointer rotates a little faster, so that means in the same direction as the pointer. So we have two pointers on top of the carrier which rotate in opposite directions. Can you imagine this? So now when you take the sum, that shows you that um, the real parts of those sideband pointers, they cancel. Right? You have plus and minus, so they cancel because they have the same size. So what's left here is just this pointer here. So basically, we have the sum of those three is always here on this axis. On the, basically, is on the pointer axis. And since we have positive amplitudes, it's always uh, above zero. So we get here this fluctuation range. It's always here in this range, given the rotation of the sideband pointers. And that means this, this fluctuation here gives you the amplitude of your amplitude modulated signal. So if you then take the magnitude of those three pointers, you get your 1 plus s. Make sense? So just taking the magnitude of those three, magnitude of carrier plus lower sideband plus imaginary sideband gives you the amplitude. So that's basically our AM demodulation. Remember the imaginary part gives you the signal itself with the fast rotating carrier. But just taking the magnitude using the real and imaginary part gives you the AM demodulation. So this shows you basically how a, our AM modulation would look like um, using those three pointers. Remember the magnitude, for the magnitude it doesn't matter if you rotate with this carrier or not. The length always stays the same. Right? Questions at this point? Does it make sense? Actually, really easy. You just have pointers. Yeah. So this is what I just said. The absolute value calculation during demodulation is identical to the imaginary part, since the real parts of the two sidebands cancel each other out. Right? So this is actually. Um, then an alternative to taking the magnitude. So either you take the real magnitude or you just look at the imaginary part here because the real parts cancel out. Right? So that's possible because they cancel. So in case of the fictional, fictional imaginary part calculation, only one of the side bands would be sufficient for correct or multi-modulation. So imagine we just cancel the lower sideband here. We would have a pointer where the imaginary part would have the same fluctuation, a little bit reduced because here the amplitude would be 
guessing that we would have still the same um, fluctuation because the signal is still present. But when we look at the magnitude, here we would have a pointer which has an angle. So the magnitude and the imaginary part would no longer be the same right, if we just cancel one side back. And that's, that's the problem here, it turns out. Yeah, so in residual sideband modulation, the lower sideband is reduced. So this is what I show here. One of the pointers now is smaller. So you can see upper sideband is larger and the lower sideband is smaller. And that means the sum of the three is no longer on the imaginary axis, but it's, it has an angle. So you can see the sum. So we have the upper sideband added to the the lower sideband are added to the upper sideband, and this is the resulting point. So it's no longer on the imaginary axis, and that means the real parts do not cancel each other out anymore because of the different sizes. And that means the absolute value is no longer equal to um, the imaginary part. And the imaginary part would actually be the correct demodulation in this case. Because we want to have um, a demodulation as if both sidebands would be present. Right? So we can only not neglect this removal of the other component by um, taking the imaginary part. But the apps value is what we really do in our mathematical demodulation and also for the diode. Right? And because we have this angle, you can see that the projection and the uh, magnitude is no longer the same. Right. So actually, we would need a projection on this imaginary part, and then uh, we get a cosine of alpha if this um, angle alpha is this um, the angle that we turn it. Right. So here, if this is alpha, then for the magnitude we get a cosine alpha. For the projection, and that is basically the distortion that we would get by using the apps value as a demodulator. Yeah, so since this angle alpha that this pointer is um, tilted is known because we do it in the transmitter, right? We reduce the cycle in the transmitter, we can actually pre distortion the transmission signal. So that using this apps or diode, uh, we get the correct signal back. Yeah. So that's convenient. Yeah. So note the AM is independent of the phase of the pointer of the carrier wave due to the um, apps formulation. So this should be. Demodulation. Yeah, that means the AM demodulation is independent of the phase position of the carrier. For instance, it doesn't matter if you use a sine or cosine function for the carrier, which is just a 90 degrees phase shift. Right? It doesn't affect the amplitude. Yeah, so and also this um, distortion is maybe also a reason why this, is, this was never used in AM radio because the ear is much more sensitive to um, distortions than the eye is to brightness distortions. So if you have some small brightness distortions, it doesn't really matter so much, but if we have um, even small harmonic distortions on our audio signal, then uh, this is quite easily audible. Yeah, so does it make sense so far? So we have residual sideband modulation, and the problem here is we get some 
distortion, some nonlinear distortion from this um, cosine alpha angle, right? which we can solve using a pre-distortion in the transmitter. Um, so it's okay. And basically, we reduce the bandwidth using residual bandwidth, uh, residual um, sideband modulation from 10 megahertz to less than 7 megahertz, because 7 megahertz is all our channel spacing. Yeah, so it's actually quite good. You're still able to demodulate it using simply a diode in the analog um, receiver. So it doesn't cost much. And we actually indeed saved a lot of bandwidth. So that was actually an important progress in the development of TV transmission. Yeah, so how can we solve the remaining problems of amplitude modulation? For instance, the carrier, which is not really necessary for information transmit transmission, but costs a lot of power for the transmitters. Or the double sideband, it's still inefficient for the bandwidth. So even for the residual sideband, we have a residual sideband, which, um, strictly speaking, is not necessary. So when we look at um, the formulations, AM with carrier has this one plus, and the carrier actually came from this one. Right? So we could just emit the one, and then we just have S times sine, and that basically removes our carrier. More, more, more. So, leads me to the next set of slides. Number nine. Yeah, so this leads us to quadrature amplitude modulation, sing, um, single sideband, and frequency modulation. Yeah, so the problem with the carrier is solved by just omitting the one for the modulation. So mathematically, extremely simple. But then the receiver must internally regenerate carriers for the demodulation. And the receiver becomes more complex. So this is now the trick. Right? The internal need to regenerate a carrier. So here we have the resulting spectrum. We still have two sidebands, upper and lower sideband, but now the carrier is gone, right? No carrier. So, so far it's mostly good for the transmitter because um, that saves power. But it's not really so ideal for the bandwidth. It's still wasting bandwidth. And uh, you could argue that bandwidth is more valuable than power. So, the idea or approach is to use a full bandwidth of both side bands for our signal of interest, but without duplication. Right? To really use this bandwidth more efficiently, basically transmit more information over the same channel. So here would be an example spectrum. You have the frequency axis here horizontally, and then you see the spectrum looks non-symmetric, which means we make better use of it. So we have basically different information in the two sidebands. So basically we double the information that we can transmit over the same channel. Yeah, so how do we achieve this full bandwidth utilization? Again, we can take a look at our pointer diagram, where we represent our carrier wave as real and imaginary part. Here we have the cosine part, and the sine part is the imaginary part. <coughs> yeah, so if we take the imaginary part, we have S times sine of omega t. Right? 
So that basically means if you take the imaginary part of this rotating pointer, we get our um, S one T times um, sine. So here, this is the sine function for the transmitter. But then this looks interesting also because we see that the real part is looks orthogonal to it. Right? So we could have a cosine modulation function on the same frequency. And if we find a function to project um, in the receiver to the imaginary axis, the sine, or to the cosine, then we would be able to transmit two different signals, one on the cosine and one on the sine part. If we could use the imaginary part and the real part for two different signals on the same frequency, because they are orthogonal. So all we would need in the receiver would be this projection function or real and imaginary part function. If we have such a hypothetical function, then we can actually do it. Right? So that's the idea, using real and imaginary part for separate transmissions. So the real part could also be used for a signal transmission. Yeah, so in AM, the real and imaginary part provide the same information. Right? Hence, it has symmetric sidebacks. But you can also use the real and imaginary part to transmit separate information. And these are separate because the imaginary and real, real part are perpendicular to each other on this complex plane. Right? And this leads us to so-called quadrature amplitude modulation. Have you heard about quadrature amplitude modulation before? So maybe you saw it when you look at um, specifications of um, DVD, digital video broadcast, for instance, over satellites. Right? Because this is where it's used. Sometimes you see, when you look it up at um, Wikipedia, for instance, you can see QAM 16, something like that. Right? Where 16 is actually the number of constellations that are which we are coming to in a moment. So this is actually now widely used for digital transmissions. So how does it work? We take, we take two different signals that we want to modulate, S1 and S2, and modulate them on two different carriers, sine and cosine, but with the same frequency. So here you can see the sine, omega t, and here the cosine, also omega t. So two carriers on the same frequency, but 90 degrees phase shift. Yeah, for the demodulation, we need a projection onto one of the two axes, real and imaginary part. And the projection is analog to vector multiplication. If multiplication with one vector, scalar multiplication projects or corresponds to the projection onto this vector. So are you familiar with this vector multiplication? If you have two vectors and they are perpendicular with each other and you multiply those two vectors, what do you get? Scalar multiplication? No? Zero. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's the important part. If you have two vectors and you multiply them to perpendicular vectors, um, the scalar product will be zero. What if they are not perpendicular? What will you get? Like if they are parallel? It's going to be product of their magnitudes. Exactly. Right. So it's only zero if they are perpendicular. If they are not perpendicular, it's not zero. And that means we can, two, we can take two vectors one is the imaginary, one is the vector for the imaginary axis and one for the real axis. And then if you multiply the received signal with those vectors, you get the projection on the corresponding axis. And um, a vector can also be a function. So in this case, 
the vector for the imaginary axis corresponds to the sine of omega t times t, and for the real part to cosine of omega t times t. Good. So this is uh, kind of a, it's a function of a vector, or instead of a vector. And functions can also be orthogonal. So these dots don't belong there. So here's a Python example that show that this works, right? So if you have something unusual, you better test it to see if it works. And this is what I did here, also for illustration. Basically, I took those vectors or functions and show what happens when you multiply. So here you can see a function using the sine. Sine pi times 10 times a range from 1 to 2 in steps of 0.01. Right, so here this range goes from 1 to 2 in steps of 0.01. And here you can see the result. So our sine oscillation. You can see that it's the sine because it starts here at 0. So I call this SHF anchor. And in the decoder, I'm using the same wave. So imagine you are able in the decoder to produce the same sine wave with the same phase. And this is the critical part, right, that you have the same phase because we want to do this projection. Then here we have the encoder cosine. Basically it's the same function except that instead of a sine I have a cosine here. And I'm assuming that I also have the same function in the decoder here, CHF deck. So now I'm trying to see what happens if we take the sine from the encoder and multiply it with the same sine in the decoder. Then this is the result. What do we see? Well, again, if we multiply two sinusoids, remember we get the sum and difference frequencies. So in this case, the difference frequency is zero, because we have the same frequency. And the zero basically produces us an offset, such that all the values are positive. And then we have the sum frequency, twice the carrier frequency, and this shows you the fast oscillation. So this um, oscillates twice as fast as the original. So when you take this and compare it with this, you can see this is about half as fast. And this oscillates twice as fast. Can you see it? So now imagine you apply a low pass filter which takes a running average. Basically it averages over the length of one period. And what will we get? What will we get when we average here over the length of one period? We're just going to receive a constant signal of, I suppose, uh, I don't know, maybe 0.6 or something? No, 0.5. So 0.5 is right in the middle. Right? Because this is, um, again, a cosine oscillation or a sine oscillation. Right? It's actually a cosine. It's symmetric. So the average will be right in the middle at 0.5. Right? So this is now the non-zero result. After low-pass filtering, which we want to do after AMD modulation anyway, we get a fixed non-zero value. Right? So here we get an oscillation with double the frequency and a constant mean value of 0.5. And Using this, we can reconstruct the transmitted signal. Right? If you th when you think about this containing this signal S, right, then instead of 0.5, we would have the S of T after low pass filtering. Yeah, so this is what I just said. We have the difference frequency of zero. So now we can um, also transmit negative values of S because then instead of having positive offset, we would have negative offsets. 
remember here, the demodulation would just be the multiplication of the two followed by a low opacity. So the average can be positive, but it can also be negative. And it depends on what value we multiplied in the encoding. So that's quite nice. So that means we don't need to have this 1 plus s. We can take s directly and avoid the carrier in this way. So now we can test what happens when we multiply the sine carrier with the cosine function. Remember, this should be now the orthogonal case. Right? So after multiplying the cosine with the sine and applying the low pass filter, we should get a zero. Right? Because um, this would be coming from the other signal. So here we take the sine multiplied with the cosine in the decoder, and this is the result. So what do you think? After applying a low pass filter, we can see we would have nothing left. Right? So here we have an oscillation, in this case a sine oscillation, a fast oscillation, which is twice the carrier frequency, and it oscillates around zero. So after applying the low pass filter, we would have zero. And that means no matter what signal we uh, applied to this carrier in the beginning in the encoder, it would not appear in this part of the decoder. Right? So that allows us to separate the two again in the decoder, in the receiver. Make sense? Yeah. So again, we get the sum and the difference frequencies. Sum is twice as much, double the carrier frequency. And the difference is again zero, but now the frequency zero also means shift of zero. Right. No offset. Yeah, so therefore the sine wave of the encoder has no disturbing influence on the cosine decoding. And the same applies for the cosine modulation in the encoder and the sine demodulation in the decoder. This allows us to separate the sine and the cosine components in the decoder, even though they are on the same frequency. Right. Yeah, and this shows how the decoder looks like. So for the first signal, S1, we apply the low pass filter to the quadrature amplitude modulated received signal multiplied with a sine component. Right. So QAM is what comes from the transmitter containing the two, uh, two components, cosine and sine. Then we take it, multiply it with a sine carrier in the decoder in the receiver, it's local sine, and then we apply low pass filter to suppress frequencies in the carrier frequency range as with A. And for the second signal, we simply multiply the received signal with a cosine function. Right. So in this way, we get S1 and S2 back. So that means the QM we have indeed accommodated twice as much useful signal bandwidth at the same high frequency bandwidth as the AM. So we can transmit basically twice as much information. For instance, we could transmit two programs on one channel, two radio programs on the AM range. So we can accommodate many more programs on the AM range, for instance. Yeah, and this is using two carriers um, one at a sine and one at a cosine on the same frequency. Make sense? Yeah, so each part of the QAM signal, sine or cosine, is an AM without carrier. So only with a 90 degrees phase offset between its original carriers. That means each part has two symmetrical sidebands, 
but after the addition of the two components, different sidebands will result. Right. And the following picture shows an example spectrum of an AM signal. So basically, here's the missing carrier, and then we see here we have two different sidebands. So we use the same spectrum as before, but with twice as much information. Yeah, and that also means carrier regeneration in the receiver is needed. Yeah, and QAM is not only used in um, the digital transmission of TV, but it's already used in analog TV for color transmission. So CR and CB or U and V are two components. So in analog it's actually called U and V. And then this S1 and S2 would be U and V. Right here you already have two components which you want to transmit. So it's very convenient to use QIM for it. And this also makes it possible to introduce color information into an already existing standard for black and white TV transmission. Because QIM is very efficient in transmission bandwidth and also in transmission power because it doesn't need carriers. Right? And this reduced power and this reduced bandwidth makes it possible to hide it into the black and white TV bandwidth without much distortion or without much noticeable distortions. So here S1 and S2 are the color components U and V in the PAL standard. So the PAL standard was developed in Germany um, after the Americans um, developed NTSC and it was uh, some improvement on the NTSC standard. So in the NTSC standard they use I and Q instead which is, um, as we saw, a little bit more efficient than U and V but more complex to compute. SICOM was, used by, was developed by the French right? they wanted to have yet another standard to uh, support the electronics industry and they use FM instead, one, one line for V and the next for U. Um, but it turns out um, technically is, it's not as good. Um, it's okay when you have strong signal, but when you have a weak signal, then you get strong color distortions. Yeah, so the problem here is, the main problem is the carrier regeneration. And this is actually one of the reasons why the French tried FM, because then they don't have this problem with the carrier regeneration. So the carrier regeneration in the decoder, in the receiver, is done with short bursts of the carrier um, in the horizontal blanking interval. Do you know what the horizontal blanking interval is? So in analog TV you have this electron beam which goes from one side to the other and then it needs time to go back to the beginning. Right? And this electron beam is controlled by strong magnets. And these magnets need time to get opposite direction. It needs a lot of power actually to um, basically destruct the magnetic field and rebuild it in opposite polarity. It needs high power and high voltages. So it can only be done in finite time. So between each line on the analog TV, <laughs> there is some um, blanking interval. That's what it's called. With this horizontal blanking interval where nothing is transmitted. It's just the time that the electron beam needs to go back from one side to the other. And this is um, part of the analog TV standard, even though today you wouldn't need it, right? With LCD displays, um, there's no electron beam which needs time to go back, right? But it's still in there. And in this time, when it goes back, you can actually transmit a short burst of a carrier signal for the color information. Right? This color information has a carrier frequency of 4.43 megahertz. They found out that this frequency uh, leads to the least amount of interference to the black and white image. So they chose this frequency and this frequency is used for the color transmission using QAM. 
and since they transmitted after each line, short burst, they can, can have an internal oscillator and synchronize on this short burst between the lines to make the phase correct. And to have the correct frequency and the correct phase. So they have a phase locked loop that locks on the phase and the frequency of this burst and basically continue this wave um, when um, this um, burst is gone. Right. So that means the carrier only needs to be present for a short period of time. It only needs to synchronize this oscillator until the next time this burst appears and it's after each line, so quite often. Yeah. So this is how it's done in TV. Um, it's actually quite similar for digital transmission like OFDM. Have you heard about OFDM? Orthogonal frequency um, division multiplex. There you have several small carriers and one of the carriers actually um, a um, it's called signal tone. Right, and this tone is used to re regenerate the carriers in the decoder with the right phase. Yeah, here's actually a plot, a time plot, where you can see those bursts. So this is a typical analog TV signal that you can see here. And the horizontal axis is now time. So this is how it looks like when you see it on the fast oscilloscope. So if you have like an antenna, a receiver, and then you have a fast oscilloscope, and um, you plot the signal at um, in the receiver. This is what you would see, or after the receiver. This is actually after demodulation here. So here you can see this is one line. This is the brightness. Right? It's actually when you go up in, in uh, the amplitude, the brightness becomes low. So the upper part is the deep black. So here's one line, here's the next line. This is the time that the electron beam needs to go from one side to the other side. And here you can see this is the burst, the color burst of 4.43 megahertz for the color information. You can see it's just a short packet um, that oscill oscillator and the decoder needs to synchronize the correct phase and frequency. Does it make sense? So now you know what a horizontal blanking interval is. Yeah. Uh, how does the receiver know when this blanking interval needs to take place or takes place? Is it just because you can some, somewhat determine when this happens in the signal? For example, if we don't mm -hmm. transmit any a signal at zero hertz, then a very narrow band exactly the carrier would be only used for this or how it's done? Yeah, first the receiver needs to synchronize to this line structure, right? this line frequency, because it needs to control the electron beam. Right? So the receiver uh, synchronizes on, on those gaps to know when the line ends. So when the line ends, then you know that this gap comes at this specific time. So basically you can turn on and off in synchrony with the lines, the old synchronization. And when the lines end is determined by the luminance signal or uh, there's actually another there's actually another PLL which synchronizes on the line frequency. Ah okay. Yeah. So that needs to be quite precise, otherwise it would have an unstable picture. It would be running through. So you have a fixed time structure, which the receiver needs to synchronize to, and in this uh, fixed time structure, it's known from the standard where those bursts are supposed to be. And then you can basically have a gate, which turns on when there's a burst supposed to be there, and then this synchronizes uh, the PLL for the color carrier. And I assume they would also have a 4.43 filter in it to make it precise and more noise robust. Yeah, yeah good question. Right. So it's actually lots of PFLs in a TV. <laughs>
Yeah, and um, this is where it's actually used more nowadays in digital television. Right? So in digital television, we take QAM as a two-dimensional um, system which can transmit um, symbols. So here again you see the imaginary part, here the sign modulation, the real part is the imaginary modulation, and each cross is a possible state or symbol. Right? So remember in digital um, transmission we have only discrete amplitude levels. Right? In our example that we used last time, we only had zero and a fixed amplitude. Right? So instead of having just zero and a fixed amplitude, you can have several amplitudes, like zero, amplitude one, then twice the amplitude, three times the amplitude, and so on. And since here we are also allowed to have negative values, you would have, for instance, um, 0.5, minus 0.5, then plus 1.5, minus 1.5, and so on. And this is what you see here. So here you would have for the imaginary part 0.5, one, plus 1.5, here minus, one, minus 0.5, and here minus 1.5. And the same for uh, the real axis. And since you have two carriers, you can have the same amplitudes on the other carrier too. So that means that each time instance, in this case, you would have 16 possible states. So four states for the sine carrier, four states for the cosine carrier. Makes four times four equals 16 possible states at each time instance. And since this is not just bits, bits means only two states, here we have 16 states, so this is called a symbol. And with each symbol, how many bits does each symbol contain if we have 16 possible states? 16 possible symbols. Four. Yeah, point four. Plus two to the power no. Yes, two to the power of four equals sixteen. Yes. And with four bits we can represent sixteen symbols. Yes, exactly. So here we have sixteen symbols. So basically we can give those 16 symbols codes, and each code is 4-bit. Since we have, when we have 4-bit codes, we have 16 possible codes. Right. So after demodulation, uh, we, will, uh, we will detect which symbol was transmitted, and then assign these codes, these 4-bit codes to it. So each symbol basically carries 4 bits. And now you can also see the more symbols we use, the more bits we can transmit in one time step. But the more symbols we have, the more closer the packaging will be. So when we have more symbols, they will be getting closer together. Right? And that's a problem if we have noise in the transmission. So what happens if we have noise? What will you see in the decoder if we have noise in the receiver, in the antenna, the weak signal? How will it show up here? Any idea? How would noise look like this in this diagram? Yeah? I assume it would move the symbols to slightly offset positions on the diagram mm -hmm. and if the noise is too, too much then some symbols might be placed somewhere where mm -hmm. some other symbol would be expected. Exactly. Okay, so if you have noise that means you have a corrupt signal. Right? So the voltages would be slightly larger or lower than they really are. Because noise means you have a voltage which goes up and down. And you have that in each direction. For the sine part, it would go up and down. For the cosine part, it would go left and right. So you would have 
kind of like a cloud around the true symbol. So in the decoder, you wouldn't receive it at the right position, but slightly off. And the stronger the noise is, or the weaker the signal, the more off it would be. And now imagine we have, um, if, if the symbols become too close for the noise, then the receiver might erroneously decide that it was the other symbol. Right? If it is shifted too far, then it thinks, oh, it must be the neighboring symbol. Right? So if you have strong noise here horizontally, then this might be decoded as this symbol. And this is, why, this is why the number of symbols that we choose in the encoder um, needs to fit to our expectation of the signal strengths at the decoder. And this is kind of tricky because it means we need to predict what kind of receiver and what kind of antenna uh, we have on the receiving side. Um, so basically some assumptions are made uh, for the signal strengths that we need at the receiver. Right? And after that, basically, it doesn't work anymore. And um, this is also why we have different um, constellations for cable, for satellite, and for terrestrial broadcast. So, for instance, for satellite broadcast, we assume that we have a very weak signal. So, what that means, we have only a a few symbols, I think it's just four for satellite, basically in one each, just one symbol in each quadrant. And for cable, it has a very high number of symbols because for cable, basically, we assume we have a strong signal and basically no interference right? because we have the medium for ourselves. For terrestrial broadcast, it's in between. And terrestrial broadcast, usually we have stronger signals, but we also have interference and noise. So this is basically the, the system designers need to decide for what um, cases um, we make um, the constellations. Yeah, so here on data world is called a symbol. And this is what I just said, the number of symbols depend on how interference proof the transmission channel is. Fewer symbols means more immunity to interference. One symbol, one process transfer per time script step and the bits indicate which of these are symbols. Yeah, related to Q QIM is the so-called um, Phase modulation, amplitude and phase modulation, APSK. Right. The difference is that the constellations lie on concentric circles, which results in few, you know, few discrete amplitudes, distances from the origin. So instead of having it on at a rectangular grid, here you have the polar coordinates basically. And you have angles and magnitudes. And this is actually for APSK4 is identical to QAM4 because in each case you just have one symbol in each quadrant. Yeah, here are some examples for digital video broadcast. For terrestrial, DVB-T, we use QPSK, quadrant phase shift key, which equals 4 QAM. So for the case of 4, it's actually many it's also QPSK is identical. Then we use 16 QAM and 64 QAM. So for DVB-T, um, there are actually choices for um, the transmitter. So they, it can be set depending on uh, what they think uh, the receiver can do. So these numbers here, they indicate the number of symbols. So 4, 60, more 64. So at 64, you get the highest bit rate, which means potentially the best video quality. But also you need the strongest signal to decode this high quality. Yeah. So I guess you have seen, yeah, have you seen what happens when you have a weak digital video signal? Never happened to you? 
think uh, was not really in the uh, wireless transmission, but some HDMI error, but maybe it's a similar that you just get very weird artifacts, nothing like some noise, but really just a number of maybe, I don't know, green blocks in some place or yeah. something that is not in any way what you would expect the image to look like. Yeah. So how do you do you guys you look watch TV using which transmission medium? Who watches satellite TV? Oh, yeah. I was um, the video it's pauses. Yours is stagnant. Yeah. Do you do you watch satellite TV? Not yet. No. Oh, in your country. So, who else is using satellite TV? Nobody? Who uses DVB-T? Who watches YouTube? Nobody watches TV anymore? Occasionally. Huh? Occasionally on satellite. Yeah. yeah. There's also streaming, right? Do you use um, streaming, like the MediaTek? Oh. So then you're using maybe none of those standards because the internet is still using another modulation. Interesting. It seems there's a shift towards internet streaming instead of um, digital transmissions. Although that only works if you have um, internet access, for instance at home. When you're traveling, then um, you're using you know, wireless transmissions and then you're back basically at one of those standards. So even if you use um, mobile data, mobile data is uh, using, among others, also OFDM. And then you're back at QAM. But then it's not broadcast, it's like one to one, which is more wasteful. For broadcast, basically, you can reach no matter how many viewers, it doesn't really matter. But if you're doing streaming, for each user, you need to have a separate data stream, basically, having a separate channel. So that uses um, a lot more bandwidth. Or you need more fine grained base stations. And I think that's what we basically see that we need more and more base stations because more and more people use um, mobile data. But then maybe people complain that they have uh, mobile base stations nearby and then we get a problem. Because it doesn't fit. Right? For high data rate, we need many base stations, those cell towers. That some people are afraid of. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so QAM can be used, uh, basically used quite often for digital transmissions. Yeah, also for. Mobile radio, the QIN principle is also used. Uh, for instance, in the um, digital trend and signal transmission in mobile radio, in this, um, I think it's a book, H. Muskowski. Yeah, and this leads us um, finally to um, another approach to take advantage of this duplication of information, but in a not as quite as uh, widely used um, modulation scheme, which is called single sideband modulation. So here, instead of um, using twice the information that we transmit over the same, same channel, here we just reduce the bandwidth. We have the same information, but at half the bandwidth. So we only use one sideband, and carrier and the other sideband where are suppressed, filtered out. 
Yeah, so we cannot really do this with video signals. So with video we have to use the residual sideband because um, due to the finite um, steepness of the filter, um, the DC, which means the constant part of the image, the brightness of surfaces, would also be filtered out. Uh, for instance, only edges would remain. Right? DC is basically where the carrier is located, and if we suppress the carrier, then basically DC is gone with it. Right? And DC for images is quite important because that gives us the constant brightness of one image. Right? If we remove it, then basically we just have the edges left. And it looks like a drawing instead of an image. Yeah, this is um, no problem for voice of audio because, or audio because DC doesn't play a role there because we cannot hear it anyway. So SSB single sideband works for audio because then it's not it's, it's okay if, if DC is missing. So that's why it's used for voice transmission. And uh, yeah, DC is also important for the color components. Um, QAM can indeed transmit DC. So as soon as we have a video, we want to have DC, the constant values. So then we cannot use SSB. Yeah, and finally, frequency modulation. Who has heard about FM? Everybody. Right? I guess most of you heard it as uh, a band. Right? It's the broadcast band, FM. But it's strictly speaking a modulation, frequency modulation. So this is also used um, in analog TV for, for instance, in SICAM, additionally uh, for the color components. And it's also used in the sound in analog TV. So the sound that you listen to is at a certain carrier um, above the image frequency, the video frequency, and it's modulated in FM. Right. And SICAM uses also for and here's the mathematical formulation. Remember AM, we had this 1 plus S times sign. And here we have the sign of omega t plus delta S. <coughs> so the signal S now modulates the frequency. It changes the frequency. As you can see here. So the frequency, this is the carrier frequency. And then there is this um, frequency deviation delta. And this just makes it wiggle around this frequency. So this has the advantage that it's uh, more robust against noise because interference is usually noticeable in the amplitude of the signal and less in frequency. Right? So this makes it more robust against interference. But the bandwidth is a problem. Right? The bandwidth here is about twi twice the signal bandwidth, like AM, but plus the frequency deviation. So this now leads to an even larger bandwidth than AM. So this is the price we pay for the noise robustness. <coughs> so it's a very poor bandwidth efficiency, um, worse than AM. And this means noise immunity is bought by poorer bandwidth efficiency. And it was invented by Mr. Armstrong in the 1930s in New Jersey. And because of this poor bandwidth efficiency, it's mainly used on higher frequencies, such as VHF and UHF and FM. So FM radius between 88 megahertz and 100 megahertz so is already much higher than AM radio. Yeah, and also there's phase modulation. It's closely related to frequency modulation. Except that now we modulate the phase offset here. So remember previously this T was outside. Now we have omega T times lowercase t plus delta times S of T. So this is basically modulating the phase of the carrier. Yeah. But when you think about S as a sinusoidal function, then you can see it's doing the same thing. When you have a sort of sinusoidal function, basically then the frequency goes back and forth. Right. Yeah, 
a little bit background on UHF, UHF channel spacing. In North America, we have 6 megahertz, also in Japan. In Australia, we have 7 megahertz. In Europe, we have 8 megahertz. So there are different um, channel spacings in different continents. Yeah, phase error during decoding of the AM, QAM. That's a problem, uh, particularly in the NTSC standards in the beginning. Um, the projection on the real and imaginary axis um, is changed when we have a slightly a slight phase shift. So imagine that this PLL is not working exactly, and we get a fine a slight phase shift as a result. And that means that this phase shift now uh, leads to rotation of the axis in the decoder, which you can see here. So the black crosses came from the transmitter, and then the decoder has a phase shift, which now rotates the entire coordinate axis according to this phase shift. And the receiver expects those red symbols. And now you can see that um, this leads to a completely different decoding. So with phase shifts, we basically have no decoding. Um, oh yeah, and I wanted to mention, when you have a weak digital TV signal, you, you indeed get those blocky artifacts, and when it's still getting weaker, basically you get nothing. Right? There's only a small range where you go from perfect image to no image at all. Right? And so that's kind of typical for digital transmission. So either you have a perfect image, or perfect video, or no video at all. And here you can also see why that happens. Because a slight phase um, shift due to weak um, um, reception, for instance, um, leads to totally different decoding signals, which basically gives data garbage. And in analog TV, um, you don't get data garbage, but different colors. So when you have a phase change um, due to a uh, faulty um, PLL or weak signal, then the entire coordinate axis of your color uh, plane is rotated. And that means you get the wrong color. Right? Basically, your U and V axis is rotated. And as a result, you get the wrong color. So here, basically, you have a rotated color pointer in this way, and that gives you a different color. Yeah. So this is particularly disturbing if you have, if you have um, skin color, because that's easily noticeable. So if you instead of a rosy tint, you have a green face, and it's quite noticeable. So that's why the PAL engineers came up with the idea to um, basically um, change the angle from positive to negative from one line to the next. Right? And that means if you have a constant phase angle, then um, this constant phase angle appears as one um, as positive offset in one row and as a negative offset in the next row. Right? Because the decoder needs to switch accordingly. Um, and that means instead of having the wrong color, you just have the average, which gives you a slightly less saturated um, color. So here, this would be the original. And then in one row, you have positive offset. In the next one, you have negative offset. And that means the average of those two would be in the middle. So that would be just a little bit length, uh, less long. So that means you would get somewhat less saturated colors. So instead of a green face, you would have a little bit less rosy face, which is much less noticeable. So that's the trick they used in the PAL, in the German PAL standard. And that actually indeed gave a much better um, color quality, because of you have um, weak reception. Yeah, so phase error in the QAM leads to phase errors. Um, and the face um, leads to errors in the color space, in the color time, and type. And that was a problem with NTSC, which is actually now solved with a reference line 
with a face color at the end of each frame. And Carl solves this by transmitting one of the chrominance values alternate, alternately positive and negative, of positive and negative angles. And then the mean is calculated over each two lines. And that means that the phase error no longer leads to the phase errors in the color type. Angle cancels out, but two errors in the length of the pointer, meaning the saturation, which is less noticeable. So here, if you see it, this pointer gets a little bit shorter, but this less saturation is less noticeable. So green complexion is more noticeable than a pale skin tone. Maybe quickly here, Seca uses FM and in one line it transmits U and in the next line uh, it transmits the V um, components and FM means there are no phase error. So advantage is also is relatively resistant to interference and um, at good signal level but the dis disadvantage is uh, that we have a large bandwidth which is a problem when um, nesting it into the luminance signal or we have a low um, peak frequency deviation which results in lower noise immunity and if the signal level is low we have strong distortions in a color signal which can occur quickly for instance we get bright orange color edges in video objects on weak receptions and that means PAL is actually much more robust with poor reception. Okay, questions at this point? Yeah. Okay. I have a general question. Uh, the problem where the speech is faster than the video, is it a modulation problem or uh, a uh, synchronization? Yeah, this, uh, this uh, uh, appears in digital video, right? In analog video, you don't have the problem because there is no storage. But in uh, digital video, you need to have synchronization information for video and speech. Right? And if this information is missing, then it can happen that you have this non-synchronous speech and audio, which sometimes indeed is a problem. Yeah. Okay, so then thanks for your attention and have a nice afternoon.